Welcome to Centennial Oral Histories, a series featuring former and current leaders of Duke University and Duke Health, sharing memories of their time at Duke and their hopes for Duke's future. Enjoy this discussion with Suzanne Wasilik, affectionately known as Dean Sue, who served as AVP of Student Affairs for 40 years. She's interviewed by Reverend Dr. Luke Powery, Dean of Duke Chapel. I'm Luke Powery, and I'm here with Sue Waslick. Um, who we know as Dean Sue. Uh, this is for the Duke Centennial Oral History Program. So Dean Sue, uh, it's a great privilege to, to be with you. Um, I have a lot of things to, to ask you, but you, you came to Duke um, as a student and you've been at Duke in a variety of roles and ways for almost 50 years. Why did you decide to, to come to Duke and to what's kept you at Duke? Great questions, Luke, and thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. And it's truly an honor to be here, to be part of this program, but to be interviewed by you, so thank you. Um, I grew up in North Carolina. Uh, my family and was originally from New Jersey. I was born in New Jersey, but we landed down in North Carolina. My dad worked in textiles. He was a mill worker, and he got transferred to Charlotte, which is where I grew up. And um, first generation in college, so I really didn't know much. I truly didn't know what was going on in this world of college. But I knew, and I knew from the earliest age I can remember that I was gonna need to pay my way. Uh, there was not gonna be any money. But I discovered that there was this thing called financial aid, um, and I applied for that in all the schools that I applied to. Um, so I narrowed down my choices of schools to UNC Chapel Hill, cool. <laughs> UNC Greensboro, which at the time offered a full ride for women mm. because the Moorhead, now known as the Moorhead Cane, was only available to men. Wow. So I, I got a full ride to UNCG. Um, I also had uh, scholarships to UNC and to North Carolina State. And then I had a financial aid package at this place called Duke. And uh, my financial aid package consisted of a grant, a loan, and work-study money. And somebody told me, my uh, counselor in high school, she said, you know, I've heard that Duke is probably a better school. She said, I think it's where students who have really achieved in high school tend to go. People just didn't know very much about Duke 50 years ago. Um, and so I decided to come to Duke. It was that simple. My favorite color is red, so I came really close to going to North Carolina State. Um, and I wouldn't have had a loan, I wouldn't have had a job, I, I would have had just a full, full ride at State. Um, but this place called Duke was very intriguing to me um, because I had heard it was a really good school. Never been here. The farthest north I had traveled on I-85 was Burlington. So I had never seen Durham or Duke. Uh, but I decided that it seemed like the right place for me. There was a student that I knew well in my high school who had come here before me, and he spoke very highly of it. So I came with very little information, very little knowledge of what Duke was all about. I did know that there were fewer people in my junior high, in my high school, who were fans of Duke. Most of the students that I knew pooled for UNC in sports, and I thought, well, maybe that school school called Duke needed more fans. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll go there. <laughs> well, you've been one of the big fans for sure. <laughs> yeah, that part has, has been fun. It has not been hard, but it was not a well-informed decision. Mm. Now, through your various roles, I mean, what kept you at Duke? Yeah, it's a and great question. What? I struggled as an undergrad, socially, mm -hmm. academically. I just didn't do well. Um, I never felt like I fit in. I never felt like I belonged. 
Oh. And I didn't really like it here. So I decided to stay for graduate school yeah. <laughs> for no good reason, <laughs> right. except they had a program that I was interested in. I was pre-med, didn't get into medical school. I was a terrible student undergrad. Talked my way into graduate school in health administration. Thought I would go to grad school um, and do better in school, which I did, mm -hmm. and then reapply to medical school. To make a very long story short, it turned out that healthcare was not my strength. I worked at, in the, uh, at Duke for a, a year and a half in healthcare. Um, but while I was in graduate school, I became an RA. And for the Ooh. first time at Duke, I felt like I belonged. But I don't think I really fully understood that until I realized I didn't want to work, work in healthcare. I was working, looking for another job. I was married at the time. My husband was a school teacher here in Durham, loved what he was doing. And so I told friends, I don't think I want to do this healthcare thing. And they said, well, there's this job in student affairs and you loved being an RA. Why don't you apply for that job? I did. I got it. And I found my passion and that was working with students. That age is just mm -hmm. magical. It's magical. And it still is. Like to this day, <laughs> um, I still feel this magic mm -hmm. being around sort of 18 to 22 year olds. Mm -hmm. So the students are what kept me here. Um, mm -hmm. Their engagement, their challenges, uh, they didn't let me get away with anything. I couldn't just give them a line as an adult. As my mother would say, do as I say, not do as I do. Hmm. That didn't go over well with Duke students. <laughs> and I learned that very early on. Um, and I just love the way they, I still do love the way they challenge me, particularly intellectually. Hmm. Hmm. They are so much smarter than I am. <laughs> and they always have been. Hmm. And uh, there's something about that that I really like. Now, you're, you're talking about the students. Obviously, you're beloved and have been. Oh, that's very kind. I don't, I don't want to talk about that part. Let's just talk about the students. No, yeah. And what, what they came up with a term, Dean Sue. Where did that come from? How did that start? Joe Taylor. Okay. I don't know if Joe will ever <laughs> see this interview, and I haven't talked to Joe mm -hmm. in decades. But Joe was on what was at the time called the FAC Steering Committee, evolved to the FAC Board, and is now orientation leaders. So Joe was an orientation leader. And when I was named Dean of Students, uh, Joe was part of the many groups that I sort of had responsibility for. He said, um, you're now a dean. You're not an assistant to the dean. You're the dean. And uh, people are going to want to call you dean. But that last name, it's too much. <laughs> he said nobody can spell it. No one knows how to pronounce it. It's intimidating. So I am going to recommend that people call you Dean Sue. I said, Joe, I don't really care. Like, it really does not matter to me. Um, whatever you want to do is fine. So he started to call me Dean Sue. Hmm. And that was the beginning of my name. Most people think my last name is Sue. <laughs> and right. um, I, have, I have had many opportunities to call students at home over the summer, over breaks, and back in the day when their parents would answer the home phone, the landline, uh, I would say, hello, this is Sue Waslick. Can I talk with Luke? And they would say, who? And I would say, Sue Waslick, I'm calling from Duke. Who? I'd say, I work in student affairs. I'm the dean of students. Oh, Dean Sue. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. So no one knew my name. And I think there's still a lot of people who don't know my name. Mm -hmm. um, but 
that that term is really today only used by the folks who remember. Right. Um, I don't really know what students, some students still call me Dean Sue today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's how it came about. Wow. Wow, well, that's, that's great. And the cooler thing, yeah. the cooler thing is my email address is Dean Dotsu. Because oh, back in the day, when you got to pick your email address and it was not assigned to you, mm. one of my colleagues who was responsible for my calendar, for my life, um, she said, can I pick your email address? I said, whatever, sure. And she picked Dean Dotsu because she didn't want to have to spell my last name wow. to people as she was answering the phone or whatever. Right, right. What's her email address? Right. <laughs> Dean Dotsu. Well, well, with all your the experience and, and with students, right, as being a student, being an RA, et cetera, et cetera, in all of these years, how, how, did, how have things shifted with students? on college campuses, or at Duke in particular? I mean, how, what have you seen, experienced, just to share some of your insights and wisdom? They've changed dramatically. Um, Duke students have gotten, I would say, uh, much more intellectual. I think they come here for a whole host of reasons, mm -hmm. knowing more. They just know more in terms of facts, mm. information. Um, that, of course, has grown exponentially with the introduction of the computer and the internet um, and just the uh, access to information. Uh, students, I think, are more curious in many ways than they used to be. They've always been curious, but now there is a heightened level of intellectualism and curiosity. Students are more achievement oriented than they used to be. Again, they've always been on a track mm -hmm. of wanting to succeed and do well and contribute. But today, this notion of achievement and accomplishment, I think, is even greater. Mm -hmm. um, but the students of the past were also all of those things. And, mm -hmm. and I think I think from an admissions standpoint, and I don't know this because I've never worked in admissions, yeah. but I've certainly talked to a lot of folks in admissions. This notion of balance was always uh, emphasized for Duke students. Duke students took great pride in the 80s mm -hmm. and the 90s, early 90s, of being balanced. Um, they weren't experts in anything. You know, they mm -hmm. were sort mm -hmm. of... Uh, they knew a little bit of everything, but not a lot of any one thing. They liked being able to uh, weave their se themselves into conversations about anything. They weren't experts, mm -hmm. uh, and they took great pride in that. They really liked that that's who they were. Um, I swore I would never say this phrase, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to violate my own rule. This notion of work hard and play hard, and I don't like to use that because yeah. it's, uh, it's a mantra that was prevalent at Duke for a number of years, but it's been prevalent at schools around the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. but they, they liked that. They liked the fact that mm -hmm. they were smart and they were committed to their studies, but they could also be very social, and they liked to socialize. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, was, that was who they were. Over time, that has shifted. Um, I don't know that the work hard, play hard has shifted and changed. I think it has mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that students are much more inclined to talk about expertise and to talk about, not just talk about, but work towards an area of expertise. Mm -hmm. um, this notion of a senior thesis I think about 25% mm -hmm. of Duke students complete a senior thesis. They, that's something that at least 25% of them right. like to do and want to do. They want to be able to achieve expertise or demonstrate expertise in a certain area. Um, that was not as prevalent, you know, 40 years ago, even 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
Students are also much more interested in making certain that their extracurricular activities align with many times their career goals. Mm -hmm. uh, they they, they mm -hmm. seem to think that everything that they do has to fit together for a purpose. It has to be a piece of the puzzle that defines them. I think that um, the students of the past were a little bit more laid back, a lot more laid back. <laughs> um, they took things as it came. But you know, you have to remember I arrived right on the heels of sort of the Vietnam War, um, free love, uh -huh, uh -huh. flower power. Right, right. <laughs> um, Duke was at a very different place in its history. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, I, students have changed in so, so many ways. And if you lay on top of that, mm -hmm. uh, all the technology that has been introduced into the world, uh, we could spend hours just talking about how, at least in my opinion, mm -hmm. that has changed students. Um, students of the 80s and early 90s, even if you were looking for a summer job, you were a lifeguard, you waited tables, um, you might work at, in an office answering the phone. Um, you might work as a camp counselor. You don't hear about students doing those things anymore in the summer mm -hmm. because that summer internship is going to lay the foundation for whatever they think their first job might be. Right. So mm -hmm. the world has changed. The students have changed. Mm -hmm. They've had to adapt to each other. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Oh, but, yeah. No, um, it does. But all of those things have, have shifted and changed. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, obviously, as you know, one of the big emphases um, at universities, Duke included, is around wellness, well-being. Um, how, and I know a lot of your, I think you have a, a kind of, I don't know, focus may not be the right word, but you see the importance of that, right, for everyone, not just students, but how do you perceive the role of health in the life of a, a Duke student, you know, or, or what are, and related to that, what, what are some of the common issues that you have seen with, you know, students today as it re relates to wellness, health, and well-being? I think from um, the pre-womb to death, mm. um, we should be focusing more on this notion of health and wellness. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it's ever too soon or ever too late to think about um, our bodies, our minds, our emotions, our spirit, and to figure out how we are taking care of ourselves and taking care of all aspects of ourselves so that we can flourish in all aspects of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could tell you that I have flourished in all aspects of my life. I wish I could tell you that my health was perfect, but um, I can tell you that it's always been a focal point for me, and I attribute mm -hmm. that to my mother who took me to a vitamin store when I was five years old. So I want you to think about that. Mm -hmm. That was 65 years ago. Wow. Um, and so she sort of uh, taught me from a very early age, this woman who had no formal education, that taking care of this, if I might use a, a biblical term here, <laughs> which I know nothing about, and I'm going way <laughs> out on a limb, but she sort of taught us that this thing yeah. here and all here and yeah. whatever is surrounding us, mm is truly a temple. Mm. It is uh, something that is sacred mm. and that we need to take care of it. Because when it's working well, everything in our lives will work well. So mm. you, uh -huh. you um, think about that in terms of being a student at Duke and you think about students really positioning themselves to flourish here. To me, the first thing that they should understand and really appreciate is taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Just taking care of all of that stuff we just I just right. mentioned. Right. 
Um, so I think it's at the core. It's at the core of everything that we should be doing, mm -hmm. whether that is in the chapel or in the classroom mm -hmm. or on the quad or in a, a, a club or organization. It, everything that we do should be done through this lens of taking care of ourselves. Now, is it perfect? No. Are we always perfect? No. Are we always going to make the right decision? <laughs> no. But um, there ought to be this mindset, I think, of wellness with everything that we do. And I will just tell you, I have a very unique opportunity right now. I'm working for a startup company, mm. and we are teaching confidence to 7 to 11-year-olds. And I won't get into all the details sure. of how we're doing sure. that. Mm. But um, the founder of that company is trying to start a brand new school. And at the heart of that school is going to be this notion of wellness. Mm. There's going to be a time and a place in every single day to take care of all of the dimensions of wellness for these children. So my hope is that we are going to be uh, really promoting many, many more generations that are gonna focus more on their health and wellness. Um, to apply that more directly to Duke, mm -hmm. I'm just delighted that we have a facility on the campus mm -hmm. that speaks to that. I think Duke made a huge investment in student health and wellness mm. when it decided to build a wellness center for students that brought all of those aspects together. Um, and I don't know if you've been up on the third floor of that building yeah, and looked the out the window, mm. but it is a perfect view of the chapel. Mm. It's one of the most beautiful views of the chapel that you will see on this campus. Mm. And the architects did that intentionally. Mm very, very intentionally, because they understood when they were designing that building all the various aspects of health and wellness, and they understood the spiritual component, mm. and they understood the importance of the chapel and the chapel being a centerpiece. Right. So when you go up to that third floor and you mm. look out that window, and I'll be happy to take you on a tour. Okay. It's not 239 <laughs> steps to the top, <laughs> um, but you can see the top. <laughs> Uh, it's just an incredible view. Mm. And I think it it's a representation to the students that this this experience, this existence is bigger than just us. Right. There's more to it. Mm. Yeah. Um, but that facility is mm. more than just symbolic, the health and wellness building. It is an absolute manifestation of Duke's commitment to making mm. certain that institutionally we are committed to student health and wellness. So I'm I'm just, it's one of the things that I am really, really delighted about that Duke committed to. That's great, all the way since you were five. Since I was five. five little did I know, <laughs> little did I know that that would, that that no, would happen. Yeah. But it's, <clears throat> when you build a place like that, you know, when you, mm -hmm. when you create something like that, what you lose is what was. And so there are very few people who are ever going to have a full appreciation for mm. what student health looked like before, right. what the counseling center mm. looked like before, um, just to name a right. few. No. You know, sure. people are going to say, oh, of course we have a meditation garden. Doesn't everybody? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Many schools do, but not everybody. Right. So, right. so, yeah, mm. I... Um, so I, I'm very committed to health and wellness, and I'm very committed to it in the classroom. Mm. And uh, I try to create a classroom that is at least what I believe to be healthy. Sure. What, just to stay with the health piece a yeah. little bit, you know, one of the statistics, I don't know what the current stats are, but in mental health, right, in higher ed and here at Duke as well, the challenges of young people, what? What do you think is at the root of those challenges? Gosh, so I have teenagers and I'm, you know, I'm just wondering what this generation. It's been a lot written. Mm -hmm. um, I could <clears throat> name some names like yeah. Gene Twinge or Twingy and Jonathan Haidt and mm -hmm. all the people who are attributing much of it to the introduction of the smartphone in 2007, 2008, um, the introduction of social media. Uh, the 
lack of any real boundaries in using those things. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing schools now ban smartphones and right. we're seeing parents uh, limit the amount of time their children can stay on social media. Is that the answer? Will that work? Is that the cause of all of this, um, you know, this explosion or crisis related to, uh, to mental health issues? Um, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think those things have certainly contributed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here a bit and hope that someone doesn't cut it off. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think parenting styles have changed a lot. Mm. The, these last couple generations of, of students, of children, um, will report, have reported, that they consider their relationship with their parent to be one of the best relationships they have. If you ask students who um, are even in their late 20s, early 30s, or young people in their late 20s, mm -hmm. early 30s, if you ask students who are right now in middle school and high school, difficult years where they're turning against adults, they will still tell you that their heroes are their parents, people that they admire the most. I wouldn't have said that necessarily about my mother and father. Maybe mm. you would have. I mean, there were things about my mom and dad that I right. really, really respected and, and had enormous regard for. But there were things about them that I, I wanted to do differently. Like I wanted to improve upon mm. some things. Mm. And if you talk with a lot of the students today, young people today, they're like, no, I, I can tell my parents everything. Um, I do tell them everything. After a test, I'm texting them immediately. Mm. Um, when I don't do well, I get in touch with them. They're the first people I call. I know they've got my back. I know they're going to protect me. And I think that's a really powerful word. Mm. They are going mm. to protect me. And so I think in some ways, mm. this notion of adulthood, and I'm not, this is nothing new, there's a lot written about right. this, has been delayed. Um, you know, legally we're adults at the age of 18, but psychologically now I think adulthood lasts until the age of like, I mean, uh, adulthood begins at like the age of 32 or 33. Mm -hmm. Up until that point we are emerging mm -hmm. adults. Um, so having the best relationship with your parents may not be the best long term. Hmm. I'll just throw that yeah, out yeah, there throw so that, that out there. people <laughs> drop you know, the mic. On so, that yeah, one. people people decades from now can think, "Oh my god, yeah. she was brilliant or what a foolish thing to think." <laughs> Cuz who knows where that's going going to lead, but hmm. we do know hmm. that um, children students today rely more on their parents than certainly my generation ever right. did. Right. We just didn't consult our parents over everything, and we didn't go to them first. And we have this thing called a GPS. Mm. I bet you can tell me where your children are right now if you had your phone. I don't track them. Yeah, well, you're, you're rare, you're unusual, <laughs> because most parents do, and they track their parents. That's right. Do your children track you? I don't know, <laughs> and I don't want to know. Yeah, but um, right, but the mechanism that there, mechanism sure. to track, and so this notion mm. of always being connected, always knowing, yeah, that sense of safety and security may have backfired a bit, mm. and maybe that's where this whole evolution of mm. mental health challenges has come from in addition to all of the technology. Right. What do you think? Wow, I can know. Oh, you're, you're, the, you're the interviewee. <laughs> I could talk about this, for, but we, there are other things to discuss. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I don't... But that is, yeah, really... I don't helpful. have all the answers, no. but mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. That's a... I'll give you just a quick example. Yeah. I have the good fortune of meeting with lots of alums over the years. Mm -hmm. And many times they bring their children to campus, obviously to visit, right. and they stop by. Some stop by because they want me to give their child some advice on the college application process or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
But it's not unusual for a conversation to go like this. Um, Dean Sue, I'd like for you to meet my son, Luke. Hi, Luke. Nice to meet you. Um, so, Luke, tell me a little bit, bit about you. Parent chimes in, oh, Luke is a great student. Luke is, oh, he's a member of the National Honor Society. He's a tri-captain of the lacrosse football and basketball teams. Um, he started the Spanish club. Luke has yet to say a word, by the way. <laughs> um, so that's okay. So Luke, tell me about the schools in which you're interested to mm -hmm. apply for college. Parent answers, well, we're applying. We are applying. Mm -hmm. And we are visiting and we are working on the applications and we. It's a very different answer mm -hmm. that I would have gotten right. 20 years ago from a parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've learned to not invite the parent into those meetings, <laughs> depending on what the purpose of the meeting is. Right, right. And if I really want to get to know that child, then mm. I leave the parent out in the lobby mm -hmm. and then bring them in later. Wow. Lots of wisdom there. Um, I don't know insights. that there's any wisdom. Oh, there it's is. just observations. Okay. Just observations. <laughs> well, let me just shift a, a, away a little bit from sort of the insights on students and Duke students and but obviously some of your answers may still point in that direction. Two things. What what moments in Duke history do you consider to be pivotal? Mm -hmm. And I would say then on the flip side also what individuals, these could overlap, what individuals in the history mm -hmm. of Duke, would you consider to be pivotal, okay. or may, you know, make they made a significant impact? I would say the selection and appointment of every single president since I have been here has mm. been pivotal, mm. um, and I think Duke has done a remarkable job of selecting the president that needed to be here at that time. And I particularly look back on Terry Sanford because of um, his political uh, prowess mm. and the need for someone who could really recognize, I think, uh, the political hotbed in many ways that Duke was mm. back in uh, the, the 70s and the early 80s, coming off of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. Um, Doug Knight had been the president here. That was not a good match. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but Terry Sanford understood civil rights. He understood uh, their significance and challenge in the South. He understood, uh, I think, what it meant when Duke integrated. He understood the importance of that, the significance, and he understood in ways that are still remarkable to me when to be here, when not to be here, when to delegate. Uh, he was an incredible decision maker. And for all I know, others may not have seen him that way, but as a right. student here during his time, mm. I always felt like he was always here and I'm not sure he was, but he just had mm. that political savvy. I'll call it political. I shouldn't use that word because it means, I think, something different today. Yeah. Yeah. But he knew how to handle those leadership responsibilities, mm -hmm. how to juggle those. Mm -hmm. um, I think when Keith Brody became president, um, he took on a very different institution than when Terry Sanford did. We had started to move from being regional to being a, a hotter school okay. and uh, mm -hmm. nationally. Mm -hmm. And he saw that Duke was growing. He saw that Duke needed to grow, that we were not going to be as informal with some of the ways that we did things. Mm -hmm. And I think he, uh, some people would probably disagree with this, and I disagreed with it at the time, but looking back on it, I think he did what he needed to do, and that was he really allowed the schools 
to uh, operate more independently and more autonomously. This notion of a decentralized uh-huh. institution uh-huh. was uh-huh. really born, I think, during his time. Uh-huh. He was sort of like, Duke Chapel, you go be the best Duke Chapel you can possibly be. Uh-huh. Right? Duke History Department, you go be the best Duke History Department you can be. Uh, the Institute of whatever, you go be uh-huh. the best institute you can be. And I think we had lots of very, very, very strong uh, places emerge here. And then uh, Nan Cohan came and sort of put them all back together. Oh. You know, she took that decentralized, very strong, independent, autonomous uh, entities uh-huh. and tried to bring them back together and recognize that from a facility standpoint, we really needed to uh, expand and uh-huh. to grow. Uh-huh. Um, and I think that uh, Dick Broadhead continued that. And all of those presidents really recognized the international scope and the international reach uh-huh. that Duke could achieve, and they allowed that to happen. Uh-huh. Um, and I think, I think there was a recognition after Dr. Broadhead Um, that there were some things that probably didn't need to necessarily be changed. They didn't necessarily need to grow. There were some things we needed to maintain. Um, And we now have Vince Price. So I I would say that all of our presidents have been enormously pivotal. Mm. Um, I also can't help but mention two people, and there are so many more than these two. Sure. (laughs) But I'm going to mention these two, and one is still here, Mm -hmm. one is retired, and I think that they, and I'm thinking of more names Mm -hmm. um, as I (laughs) think of these two, but they were so important in um, establishing a relationship with Durham from an economic standpoint, mm. and that is Scott Selig and mm. Tom and Trask. Mm. They work together. Mm-hmm. The renaissance of Durham, and I'm not talking about the Duke-Durham partnership with right. the schools that right. so many people were involved with, and I'm sorry to not mention all of those folks, sure. but just the renaissance of Durham. Mm. Uh, they were absolutely pivotal in the way that they managed negotiating the use of space in downtown Durham, Mm -hmm. Um, not building new space, but telling developers and others, if you build, we will lease, Mm. we will rent that space. And that made a huge, huge difference Mm. in being able to infuse Duke's um, financial resources into the city without building another building that was gonna be property tax free because we were Duke. Right. So it, uh, just a brilliant, brilliant mm. way that that worked. Mm. Um, I would say it's hard to not think of the last 50 years and not think of Coach K mm. um, and to have been here when he was hired. He and I both started, oh. I started in the dean's position and he started in the head coaching position at about the same time. Mm. Um, we're both Polish. That was really cool. We need the Dean Sue Court or something. (laughs) I don't think so. No, no, I can't dribble or pass or do any of make a basket. But um, to have watched him arrive, and in his first three ish years, to be so unsuccessful, and for people who are still alive today to create an organization called the Concerned Iron Dukes, Mm. separate and apart from the institution, and go to Terry Sanford and go to the AD at the time, Tom Butters, and say, you need to fire this man. And for the two of them to say, no, we're sticking with him. So kudos to Tom Butters Mm. and to Terry Sanford, Mm. but particularly to Coach K for having done what he has done at this place. Um, It's pretty remarkable. A lot of people don't remember the concerned Iron Dukes. It's 40 years ago, so 40 plus years ago. But um, 
We've had some incredible leaders here that have, you know, stayed the course when the course needed to be stayed. Oh. Um, but the presidents, uh, as I said, Tom Butters, Coach K, Tom and Trask, just going to give a, Scott, a shout out to Scott yeah, Seelig, although Scott. he is still <laughs> still here. Um, and there are a lot mm -hmm. of people in the health system that I could certainly name as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, I think of people like Juanita Kreps, mm -hmm. you know, just as as women, um, and I think of women from the from the women's college that uh, that I actually knew someone like Mary Grace Wilson, who was the Dean of Women. Um, none of them are any longer, here any longer, but mm -hmm. you know, we all have benefited from being able to stand on their shoulders, mm -hmm. all of those people. Um, yeah. Hmm. How, I mean, you naming, obviously, those in the past, even some current people, how has, Duke changed. Yeah, I'm gonna name one more. Go I gotta, ahead. I gotta go, name go the guy. I gotta name the guy who hired me as a dean of students. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta name the man who did that. that. Um, he was the first vice president for student affairs. Oh wow! And I'll just tell you a little bit about okay. him. His name yeah. is Bill Griffith. Hmm. Bill is still alive. He lives oh, over at the Forest yes. at Duke. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He's gotta be 96 or seven. Probably 90. Probably be 97 in June. Mm -hmm. Um, and Bill was there with Doug Knight. Okay. Because Doug Knight, when he was president, and all hell was breaking loose on this campus with the takeover of the Allen Building, mm. the storming of the president's house, the silent vigil. Um, Doug's strength was not in working with students, but Bill Griffith's was. Mm. And Bill was the dean of men there was a dean of women. Those two were merged in 1972 to the dean of student affairs, which Bill became. Okay. And then in 1979, Bill became the vice president for student affairs. And that position, of course, still exists mm -hmm. today. Right. It's got a dual appointment with the provost, so mm -hmm. it's a vice president and mm -hmm. vice provost. Um, but Bill was the person who laid the foundation for what student affairs is today. That was the first recognition when that position was created that there was this robust life outside the classroom. Hmm. Like what students did in residence halls right. and learned in residence halls and what students learned through clubs and organizations and being on student government and being in the university union um, that all of those things, those experiential aspects of their lives outside the classroom mattered. Mm. And that was his gift mm. to this place. So a shout out to Bill Griffith. Oh, Thank that's you. That's great. Yeah. How, how, have and you, you were seen, asking how uh, Duke yeah, has changed, how, but we'll get yeah. back to that. Yeah. How, how do you, how have you, what things would you name that in terms of what stand out to you about change? Well, it's change significantly things? bigger. Mm -hmm. The enrollment hasn't increased all that much undergraduate-wise. Um, okay. It's incre increased some. Okay. You know, we've had to build some new residence halls, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I know the engineering school had a very, very intentional increase in their enrollment for four years, fifty students a year. So mm. they added two hundred students over four years. Uh, Trinity and has added some students, mm -hmm. but you know maybe a thousand ish, maybe a little bit more, but it, it hasn't, you know, we've, we've maintained that mm -hmm. sort of uh, secret size, you know, that <laughs> special size yeah. of, of, of not being too small, too big, mm -hmm. you know, we've been that Duke size. But if you look at the professional schools and the graduate schools, they have grown mm -hmm. exponentially. Okay. Particularly their master's programs have mm -hmm. grown enormously. So we think about the enrollment at Duke, and people are shocked when you tell them there are 6,800 undergrads and over 10,000 graduate professional <laughs> students. That just can't be, mm -hmm. but it is. Right. So that, is, that has shifted mm -hmm. and changed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I can put a finger on how it's changed the institution. 
you know, sort of um, at that meta level, yeah. but it has certainly changed Duke um, facility wise, oh. the size of staffs, the size oh. of faculty, um, and the reputation of the institution. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's sort of how, how do you, how do we decide where our reputation comes from? Is it at the undergraduate level? Is it at the um, graduate and professional school level? I think it's a combination of both. Um, but I think we underestimate sometimes the impact that the graduate and professional schools have had uh -huh. on everything uh -huh. related to Duke, the size, the facilities, the scope, the reputation, the diversity of the institution. You know, when I came to Duke in 1973, it's pretty Southern-ish. Uh -huh. yeah. um, it was very white. Um, and it was very male. Oh. So I had, when I was at Duke as an undergrad, I had two or three women professors oh. my entire time. Wow. And they were all in education. They were all in education. Oh. If I had been in the School of Nursing, there would have been many female faculty, um, but in Trinity College in 1973, there were very, very few. Ann Scott is the one who comes to my head. She was in the Department of History, mm. but just I didn't have any female faculty members. Wow. So fast forward to today, yeah. if we look at the racial and ethnic diversity of our faculty, if we look at the gender diversity of our faculty mm -hmm. and of our student body. It's just in a totally different place. International students, mm -hmm. yes, a few, but uh, not very many. And this notion of study abroad, I think close to, if not 50% of our students go abroad now. It was a very small number of students who went abroad. Mm -hmm. um, East Campus is now a first year campus. It, has evolved over my time. Right before I got here, it was the Women's College. Then it was a merged conglomeration of East and West of all kinds of residential mm -hmm. opportunities. Uh, East tried to be a mirror of West, didn't oh, work real okay. well. Mm -hmm. And in 95, East became all freshmen. It has maintained that identity mm -hmm. up until today, uh, but that was very different. And there are still graduates of the Women's College who frankly, are pretty pleased with the identity of East Campus, but they didn't like, you know, the, the merger of the two okay. back in 72. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're international. I mean, we're just international. <laughs> we're not a regional Southern school anymore. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. we are one of the most selective schools in the country. And we have been able somehow, I think in a very unique way to excel in athletics, I don't know how much longer we'll be able to say that in the same way that I mean it today, because I think mm -hmm. we're seeing a, a huge shift there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think we can still refer to our students who play varsity sports here as student athletes. Right. Um, Club sports has exploded over my time here. We used to have intramurals and varsity, mm -hmm. but this notion of having, I don't know, 17, 1800 students involved in club sports, mm -hmm. that's a pretty big deal. To go from 100 clubs and organizations to, I don't know, four or 500 clubs. Early 80s, we had one a cappella group we now have nine, maybe? <laughs> yeah, something like something that. Like yeah. that. Yeah. To go from yeah. um, the early 80s when the retrenchment report said that we should minimize the arts at Duke mm. and all things of a cultural nature, cultural meaning the arts. Oh, okay, okay. Um, mm. And we now have the Ruby, we have the Nasher, we have over 15 dance groups. We have majors in dance. Um, we have many, many students who not only focus on the arts from 
an academic standpoint, but from an extracurricular standpoint. That is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of alums who don't understand why students don't attend more sporting events. And I'm like, there's more going on. There's just more to it. <laughs> True. Students have mm -hmm. broader interests today mm -hmm. than they used to. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. So with, I mean, thinking about Duke and the centennial, what makes you, what, what are you proud of as you think about Duke? What, well, what makes you proud my, about Duke? It blows my mind that I've been here 51 of those 100 years. I just have to say that. Like, where did they go? How did that happen? That was never my yeah. intent. I've talked to, to you already yeah. about why I stayed so long. Yeah. And I want to add one more thing about yeah, why I stayed please. so long. The opportunities have been incredible. Mm. Um, just as I might have been getting a little bit, feeling a little stale or mm -hmm, bored, mm -hmm. something came up. Mm. Something came up. I got an opportunity to be on an exciting search committee, or I got a chance to be faculty in residence, mm, or, okay. you know, there was something, or I got to teach, there was something that was added that just mm. was like, oh, it's, it's now better than ever. Um, so the opportunities, and I think mm. our students see that mm -hmm. as well. Um, Would you say those things, what you just said, yeah. it's a part of what's given you joy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But at the heart of that has always been the students, because mm -hmm. to me, everything, you know, people say, oh, you wouldn't have a university without faculty. Well, that's true. Right. But, you know, the faculty would be here as a think tank or a research mm -hmm. institute if it weren't for the students. So right. for me, the heart is the students. Mm -hmm. And when I walk into a classroom, I am not at the center. They are. Right. And that will always be the case as far as I'm concerned. Mm. But over the last hundred years, yeah. what was your question? What, what makes, what are you proud of? Am I proud of? As you think of Duke. Gosh, there's so many things. Um, I'm really, I'm really very, very proud of our commitment to this thing we call excellence that Duke really does try to be excellent in everything that it does. We strive for that. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not a mediocre place. You know, Duke University, the mediocre university. <laughs> um, there's just nothing that we, and I think we've paid a price for that too. I mean, I think mm. we've instilled that in our students and everything, and that may, mm. you know, contribute somewhat to just this achievement uh -huh. and accomplishment mindset. But um, I'm very proud of that. I mean, I'm proud of people wanting to do the very best. I'm proud of uh, the innovative programs, whether it has been the FOCUS program, or Duke Engage, or Duke Immerse, or all the things related to Study Away, global education, mm -hmm. um, whether it's been uh, Duke's willingness to uh, examine itself, whether it's the curriculum, although I think we took a little little longer than I would have liked <laughs> to, 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 to take a look at that. But um, just always trying to do better, always trying to improve never really uh, satisfied with where it is. And I also think that I'm proud of, frankly, the resources that we've had. I'm not sure that those of us who have been the beneficiary of those resources, being able to innovate and, um, and to really create new programs. Mm -hmm. We've been lucky. We've been really lucky. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel that way, but oh, I know that you've been the blessed. beneficiary oh, of those opportunities, but I think so many of us mm -hmm. have. Um, I am very proud of Duke's commitment to health and wellness. Um, I know we've talked about that mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. but I hope that it will continue to, mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. I was very proud of its um, 
commitment to the Healthy Duke initiative, uh -huh. which got with COVID, you know, yeah. kind of yeah. had its mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so proud of our alums. You know, folks who've gone through this place have just gone on to do some of the coolest <laughs> stuff. And um, I had the very good fortune of knowing many of them in their developing years, mm -hmm. where their frontal lobes were not fully right. <laughs> in place, where their decision making was not always the best. And yet they've gone on mm -hmm. to grow up to be some of the most successful and cool people. So it's been a joy for me to be able to see them when they were 18, and many of them now in their 60s. Wow. And to know their children, um, to know their siblings, to have gotten to know many of their parents, um, and to just watch the full development of individuals, of families, of communities that they've been a part of. So um, not very many people have an opportunity to do that at the same place for five decades mm -hmm. and to watch individuals and to watch a university really just grow and develop and mature and, uh, and develop a reputation. Mm -hmm. Talking about the development of frontal lobes. Yeah. I know. Um, you, Peter, you have, you have two children, don't I you? I do, yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you, Peter Fever, and Anne Crossman um, co-authored a book. Yeah, and if you could talk to Peter yeah. and Anne for me. <laughs> it's only, um, it's called Getting the Getting Best, the out, best of out of College. I know you have a yeah. question about yeah. it, but yeah. I'll what, let you finish. What's the most important advice out of that book for... For the well, readers, would you say? I mean, there's a lot of yeah. advice. I'm going to buy book. it. <laughs> well, you, I, you know, good luck. I mean, there are still some copies over okay. at the Gothic um, okay. in the in the Duke Bookstore, but okay. um, uh, it was it came out in 2008. Okay. So I want you to know it is outdated. Okay. It was updated okay. in 2012. So okay. we came out with the second edition. Mm -hmm. And I really am, have been trying to convince Ann and Peter that we need to do a third edition because we need to add some things in there yeah. about technology. Mm -hmm. You know, Peter and I have continued to teach. Um, I lived in a residence hall for almost 10 years. So I think there's some things that we need to add mm. to that book, but I can't, I can't seem to get their attention. So <laughs> maybe you could talk to Peter <laughs> okay. for me about that. The best advice... I think one of the things that is in that book that continues to be something that I share with students routinely all the time, and I tell high school students, um, I tell everybody, your major is not, does not define your career. So what you major in in college is not what defines what your life will be hmm. and look like. And so you need to pick something in college that you just really love to study. Either like the, you found some great professors uh -huh. or you found something about it that just really, really lights your fire. You uh -huh. know, you love to read about it, you like to talk about it, you like, um, uh, you like to study it, you uh -huh. just really wanna, and that is not necessarily related to your career. So I'm going mm. to go and ask you, what was your major as an undergrad? Oh, music. So I know you sing mm -hmm. um, when you preach. Mm. Um, I know you have continued mm. to develop your interest mm -hmm. in music and music is it very much the heart of who you mm -hmm. are. But <laughs> you're the Dean of the Duke Chapel and you have That's been right. A theologian, mm -hmm. you have been a preacher, mm -hmm. um, you have been 
a man you are, a man of the cloth. Um, so music did not define your career trajectory. Mm -hmm. I was a science education major, pretty much biology. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, we can find people yeah. where their major does have a closer For connection sure. to what that career has been. But I really work so hard at encouraging students to find that intellectual passion. Mm. I didn't find it as an undergrad. I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I found it later, stumbled upon it, um, and it has not, still hasn't defined my career. Mm. But I love studying and reading the law. I never imagined going to law school. Um, and now I teach law. But it doesn't, still doesn't, you know, define right. who I right. am. So I, I really think that's mm. one of the things that in that book, in when we wrote in 2008, mm -hmm. um, you know, many, many years later is still true. Oh. Thank you. One final question for yeah. me. As we look at Duke going into its second century, what are your hopes for Duke? I hope I live to be 150. No, <laughs> you said for Duke. Um, my hope for Duke is that it finds great comfort in being a leader in higher education. I think it's hard today to be a leader in higher ed. Um, our world, our country, and this thing we call higher education, colleges and universities, the whole thing, everything we do today is so impacted by fear. And I hope that Duke will not be pulled back and pulled down by fear and will instead be inspired by what it has been able to be inspired by over the last many years. And that is being a leader, being willing to take a risk, being willing to be innovative, and being willing to step out of line, stepping out of the line, and doing things because they think it's the right thing to do and not because they think it's what everybody else is doing. Mm. That's what I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Sue, thanks so much for thank everything you, Luke. you've given us. You're so kind to this do this afternoon. interview. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It'll be interesting to see, you know, where this thing lands. Will it end up in a time capsule someplace? <laughs> Will anybody ever watch it? Who knows? It doesn't matter. I've enjoyed yes. our time together. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks.